Okay, we will get started. So, uh, I guess uh, the op I guess the thought would be to open up with um, your medical doctor, and there's a lot of things you could do to spend your time, to make money, to research. You could go into a lot of areas. Um, you could have been a cosmetic surgeon. You could have gone into cancer. What, you know, I don't hear of that many doctors have, who have focused and written a whole book on Alzheimer's. Why have you chosen this path to focus on dementia and Alzheimer's when you, of all the things you could have done with your medical degree, why have you decided to be so focused and make this a priority of your time? So uh, both Aisha and I come from a very medical background. Uh, my uncle's actually uh, was a, uh, a surgeon here in Columbia University um, and a professor emeritus here at Columbia University and many other family members who were surgeons and doctors and I saw them go through their process. And um, to me it seemed like repetitive behavior um, and not so satisfying. And, and you might have heard recently <clears throat> about the stress on doctors. Um, the stress on doctors is, has nothing to do with the amount of work. We're very used to doing lots of work. It's with purpose. Uh, those of you who were here earlier on talk, heard me talk about purpose over and over again. Uh, when we went into medicine, we went into it, all of us, no matter how cynical of a doctor it was, there was one, some element of service in there. Doctors don't go, go into this with the idea that I'm going to come out making money. They think they're pretty smart. You know, they take these big, difficult tests, and they know that they could have gone the business route, other routes, and they know that no matter what field of medicine, you're not going to become a billionaire or a millionaire from medicine. So it has to be something more, doesn't it? So it has to be a service orientation. And you want to serve, and you want to connect, you want to talk, you want to look at somebody in their face, in their eyes, and, and connect. There, there's that component. <clears throat> After four years of medical school where you're, actually four years of college where you're racing from physics, biochemistry, chemistry, organic, to the test, four years are gone. Four years of medical school, you're in the library, day and night, not much else, and you're basically studying molecular stuff over and over again, and part of your soul is dying right there. Um, I'm going through this, and I don't know where this is going to end up, but let's go with it, <clears throat> because it's honest. It's actually coming out. Then four years of residency, the word residency and internship actually came from the concept that when you, back in the past, when you were in residency, you literally stayed in house for four years, five years, six years. If you were a neurosurgeon, seven years to eight years. Or if you were a Duke neurosurgeon, 10 years, they call it decade with Dave or something like that. So in house, you were technicians, profound technicians. The, the one solace was you felt good that you were intelligent, people looked at you as, you know, in a good way. But it really takes a lot out of you. And then you come out, out of fellowships and everything else, 17 years later, and you're told to see patients 15 minutes at a time, diagnose, evaluate, examine, and then give, give treatment. And you know that even the patients that say they don't like pills, studies have shown, <clears throat> when they came out of a room that, from a doctor that gave pills versus a doctor that didn't give pills, even the ones that actually said they didn't like pills, guess, guess which one was rated higher? the one that gave pills. So the pressure of giving a pill is so intense. So really, 18 years, in our case, 30 years of schooling with PhD, MD, and everything else, and I'm supposed to look at you in the eye, smile, no, you gotta look at me in the oh. eye. <laughs> <laughs> pat you in the back, fake, because how many times am I gonna pat you honestly in the back? At 30 people in a day, and write a prescription, get you out, really? That's why I went to medical school for. And the only satisfaction is like maybe a Mercedes or a, two weeks, gone. That's why we're stuck on uh, uh, a Toyota Sienna. Yeah. <clears throat> when we were directors of brain program at uh, Cedar sinai for the first time, I, and we were the directors of brain program, uh, Alzheimer's prevention, I learned about these cars that I had no idea existed, Bugatti and Maserati and all this stuff. And one day I came out, and I always wear a shirt no white jacket, no, 
not, not to create a separation between patients. And somebody threw me the key and said, park my car. I should have, it was a Bugatti. I should have just taken it away. That doesn't satisfy you more than two weeks. So we learned that quickly because we reflected on our own parents and our own uh, family members. And then we did some service work. And the satisfaction of working in Afghanistan and Somalia and other places where we got no money, yet the satisfaction was exponential. Or San Bernardino County, going to the churches, was so immense that we decided that we had to do something differently. And that shook up our paradigm. It was a paradigm shift. <clears throat> and that paradigm shift actually told us, even though we, we were just coming out of a UCSD, the number one neuroscience program in the country, and they said, do clinical trials and clinical work and molecular work, or you're not going to get a grant. He said, no, we're going to take the road less traveled. And we ended up in Loma Linda instead of Harvard or Brigham or something like that. And it has paid off. It, we've ne we still have the Toyota Sienna, one car, a dog and two kids. And we've never, ever been dissatisfied in our life. Yeah. So very okay. long answer. Okay, so just, uh, that's, it's Dean, Aisha, and Peter, so everyone knows who, who everyone is. Um, <laughs> so Peter Bregan at the end, and Dean, Knight, Aisha, Scherze. Okay, so the first question is, um, it's 2019. Is Alice, you know, when we talk about autism, the rates have changed in the last 60 years. When we talk about Alzheimer's, um, have I just not been aware of it? Has Alzheimer's and diabetes has gone way up, obesity has gone up? What is the difference in the prevalence, not the total number, but you know, the prevalence, the percentage of people with Alzheimer's compared to 50 years ago? Is it, a, how, what is the difference? Okay, it's significantly higher for two reasons. One is we became aware of Alzheimer's truly as a nation when 1994, President Reagan actually announced, it was announced that he had Alzheimer's. It wasn't that it didn't exist before. It just became much more, uh, you know, uh, highlighted. <clears throat> the second thing is the prevalence grew for two reasons. Diseases that used to kill us, we're managing those, but they're causing other things secondarily. Diabetes is being managed, but it's causing the damage that leads to Alzheimer's. Hypertension is being managed not well, actually, but it's causing the dementia. In fact, one paper that just came out, we just spoke about it in our social media, that even mild elevated blood pressures on a regular basis at midlife increases your chance of Alzheimer's by 20%. So that's the disease part. We're managing chronic disease semi-well, but we're causing other things secondarily. And the second thing is we're getting older as a population, significantly older. Most of the people don't recognize how quickly we're aging, and that's a wonderful thing. But with that comes, if you're aging without any change in your perspective and your paradigm, you're aging poorly. And there is the answer. Doing anything poorly is not good. So we're aging poorly with chronic disease, with medication that just surface covers things, but doesn't do anything fundamentally. Let me give you an example of high blood pressure. I know it sounds like I'm gonna, I take everything long, but here, I'll be short as much as I can. High blood pressure medicine. You have high blood pressure in your 40s. So they give you a blood pressure medication. <clears throat> what does the blood pressure medicine do? Nothing. It just opens the vessels artificially and nothing with regards to what's going on underneath. The pathology that's accumulating because of the food and stress and everything else. So you've artificially maintained it open. In six months, because the damage continued, now you need two blood pressure medicines. In three years, now you need three medicines, then it's done. What have you done to reverse the underlying cause? Nothing. What can reverse the underlying cause? By now you should know the term, lifestyle. But when have we ever taught anybody in medical school to even say the words lifestyle, let alone teach lifestyle? Never. In fact, even in any population of doctors, they're so cynical to even bring it up, not because they don't believe in it, because they don't believe that we can make the change in the population. So we have to do it. Those are the factors. 
Um, hi. Um, I, that's the first time I've ever been late. Um, but <clears throat> I mean, quite literally, for anything like this. But then again, it's the first time I've been 81. So <laughs> who knows? Um, <clears throat> we don't have any kind of day. Uh, I don't disagree with anything. By the way, I, I, I love their presentation so much, I, I bought um, the, your book. Um, and I wanted to say that I learned something from, from your uh, presentation about um, how to help my mother-in-law, who I actually invited to come live with us because I wanted her to know I really meant it. She's 94. And I'd been afraid to challenge her short-term memory issues. She fell and had a concussion, and things just went down. Um, so I'm going to challenge more and encourage a more she's a very, very intelligent uh, woman. But the, the other thing I found about it was um, that the love in the new family um, at first was very unaccustomed to her, uh, that people were actually living together in a loving manner. Uh, that that was their priority. And um, she has actually responded enormously to that. And the trauma that brought her to us, because she was lived far away and she was not being treated well, that's why I said, come on here. The, uh, the effect of just a therapeutic kind of intervention with her about the future, about hope, about um, the love that was still ahead, about that the, that the dog was going to live at least another seven or eight years, and maybe more, and um, teasing her about getting a Yorkie, and reminding her just, just what our lives were about together and what a blessing it was for Ginger. And she pulled out of being in the depression on top of the concussion and the losses. So at 94, she's responding to the principles, you know, I believe in of how you help people, and I was just very pleased with that. But I was really off base in, in being afraid to play cards with her and challenge her. Um, she always won uh, at, uh, at Jen, and um, I didn't see anything I could gain from playing her, because if I won, it didn't prove anything clearly. And if she won, it's going to be an embarrassment. And I told her that, and she says a good sense of humor, but I was a little afraid to challenge her. And I think that's a real gift already, just for me, from, from listening to you and knowing you. We, we don't have any data, but there's been a huge increase in giving neurotoxins to everyone. And it's got to be playing a very significant role in, um, in Alzheimer's-like diseases. I don't know what its contribution is going to be to the specific. No one's looking at it. But we have data for every group of psychiatric drugs that they cause um, in, in some people, a significant percentage, atrophy of the brain and dementia. And why, why wouldn't they? They're, they're poisonous to the, to the nervous system, to the brain, to the mitochondria, to the cell, the cell membranes. I mean, they're just not, not uh, good for uh, people. Um, okay. And um, I'm supposed to look forward. That's a good idea anyway. <laughs> um, so I think we need to look a lot more at that because we have so many studies of brain injury in children who uh, are getting the uh, stimulant drugs that uh, it was originally used as a claim that ADHD uh, came from brain damage. And there's an ADHD isn't even a disorder that you can define. It's meaningless. It's just a bunch of things that irritate teachers. Every single line is something that irritates teachers. It wasn't even intended to, to, to have the parents give the drugs. It was aimed at recruiting the teachers to control the kids with a drug that kills spontaneity. So even there, uh, uh, I was at the consensus conference. I was the scientific expert on um, adverse effects at the ADHD <coughs> consensus conference. And they produced slide after slide to show that ADHD was uh, a brain disorder. And we challenged them and, and said, do you have a single one where they weren't on drugs? Oh, no, no, we don't have any. It's very hard to find anybody who isn't on drugs, which is a, a lie in terms of all the children that are getting diagnosed ADHD. So uh, in regard to the antipsychotic drugs in, in Great Britain, 
some friends uh, Pe of mine. Peter, let, let me let me stop you. I'm gonna add, I'm gonna try to go through 50 questions and give you an opportunity okay. to be very specific. And so, although this would be great to get lots of information, I would like to try to ask very quick, sharp questions um, <clears throat> for our non-scientific audience, which is 98% of them. Okay, so let me just go okay. through here. Okay, so. Just to be clear, um, if diabetes has gone from very low to close to 10% and um, obesity has gone from under 10% in the 1960s to 40%, what, what was Alzheimer's as a percentage of, I don't know, six people over 65 in, 19, in the 60s versus today? Is there any information? We don't know okay. because it wasn't being diagnosed. Okay. It was not being diagnosed. First of all, it wasn't being diagnosed as Alzheimer's let alone as far as percentage is concerned. Do you guys have a guess or an estimate, a gut feeling? Like, is it, is it like, diet, like obesity and these other things that it's clearly become a much bigger problem? Or is this clearly, are we, are we, you know, it's one thing to say the population's aging. Or are we saying it's never been like this? We have a crisis. It's gone up from a tiny thing to a big. Like, is this, like diabetes and obesity, something that's gone up dramatically? Or has it always been like this? Uh, no, so that's a separate question. It, is a, it has gone up dramatically. It is a crisis. It's a crisis because of the numbers and the rate of numbers going up. Remember that when we start collecting data really accurately from the 1980s till now, it has gone exponentially up, more than 123% up. So there's some data there. And as far as the other problem is cost, the cost to the healthcare system was non-existent 50 years ago when it came to Alzheimer's but it's now three times heart disease, or four times heart disease, the cost of heart disease. So there, there, that's an indirect measure of how it has changed. I'd like to add something to that. So yes, it's, it's <clears throat> definitely gone up, but I think the definition has also changed. There was a time when you know, people, elderly, would have cognitive impairment, but it was synonymous with getting old. Oh, yeah, grandma or grandpa forgot you know, what they ate for breakfast, and that was considered normal. And that happens now as well, but it's not supposed to be normal. It's not supposed to be normal for somebody in their 60s to have significant cognitive impairment. And I think with, um, with more information, with examples like uh, President Reagan and you know, having movies and documentaries about you know, what brain health is and what dementia is, I think people are getting more aware. And even that awareness is not ubiquitous in, in, in our society. There are a lot of communities, and you know, especially the Hispanic community, who don't have real access to, to health care, and they consider taking care of their elderly at home. If the, if the symptoms of cognitive impairment arises, they're never taken to a, to a hospital or a clinic. So I think that's what is causing a little bit of confusion as far as numbers are concerned. So yes, we are getting older. We are not living a healthy lifestyle, and the definition of dementia has changed significantly. <clears throat>